Hello and welcome to day 11 of Women in Antiquity. Today we're going to be talking about that fascinating individual, the Roman matron, and uh, ideas of gender in the Roman world. So first let's talk about the Roman world itself, and uh, since we're switching from Greek to Greece to Rome, we'll um, have a little bit of background to cover. I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. So the, uh, the Roman origin story starts much later than the Greek. Um, the, uh, the Romans are part of a large wave of Indo-European migration into Italy, um, one of several such uh, massive migrations out of the Indo-European homeland that we've seen uh, into the Mediterranean world over the course of ancient history. Um, we've uh, seen two influxes of Greeks, uh, uh, and, uh, and here we see uh, an influx of, uh, of Italian peoples that takes place uh, uh, toward the beginning of the Iron Age. And so Rome starts to emerge as a single entity out of the various villages that are um, that populate the hills uh, near the um, the fording of the Tiber in the place where Rome now lies, uh, somewhere around the uh, the seventh century. The um, the Roman uh, tradition has its uh, its founding date in the middle of the eighth century, seven fifty three BCE. Um, but um, what we can tell archaeologically points towards a somewhat later date. Uh, in particular, the lands in between the, uh, the great hills that, uh, um, that are the heart of Rome, the Capitoline, the, um, the Palatine, and the Aventine, uh, the, the lands in between them uh, were originally swampland. And we see these, these marshes being filled in uh, and constructions being made upon them, uh, the paving of the Roman Forum and uh, the building of some of the uh, earliest uh, constructions, the earliest uh, um, temples and uh, public buildings around the Forum. This is taking place around uh, 650. And so this is a little bit more consonant with, uh, with the Roman uh, legend of their own origins. The regal period for the Romans uh, involves a, a succession of seven kings, starting with uh, the legendary figure of Romulus. And seven kings is a little bit more um, likely to be reasonable uh, in a period of uh, 150 years rather than 250. In any event, uh, the Romans uh, cast out their kings uh, just before the year 500 and uh, enter into a, a new era, a new kind of, of society. The basic idea of the Republic is that it is governed by um, a large number of noble families that, uh, that share the responsibility for the state. Uh, and uh, the structure of the Republic is designed to ensure that no one individual becomes more prominent than any other. Uh, and so the, um, the Republic ends up being governed uh, as a sort of um, a collection, a succession of, of figures that are um, you know, highly trained in, uh, in, in war and governance, but then pass on their, uh, their duties and responsibilities to other members of their generation and uh, increasingly to the next generation. Um, and, and so as a result, uh, the Roman Republic uh, uh, you know, creates uh, this uh, the, the one of the strongest states in the ancient world through this um, very unusual situation of collective governance. Uh, it is very much not a democracy. Uh, it is not ruled over by the people, although, of course, it has uh, a, a, an assembly that votes laws that are put before it, and uh, the, the voices of the people are are, are very uh, are very strong, and uh, there's a great deal of tension between the, the nobility and the masses. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the the hands uh, the governance of the governance of the republic is in the hands of um, the 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 aristocratic families of Rome. Uh, so successful is this uh, is this form of government that it is under the republic that Rome uh, uh, is able to accomplish its dominion of the entire Mediterranean. It begins by uh, dominating central Italy around it and then gaining hold of uh, the entirety of Italy itself and then uh, control of the Western Mediterranean. And then by the year 150, uh, it has more or less cemented its domination of the Eastern Mediterranean as well. The Hellenistic East, that is the legacy of the conquest of Alexander the Great, are essentially under the dominion and influence, if not, uh, in some cases, outright rule uh, of the Romans themselves. So the Romans are able to complete their, uh, the, the foundation of their empire, the control of the entire uh, Mediterranean world with the accession of, of Egypt, uh, the death of the last pharaoh, Cleopatra VII, in, uh, in, uh, in 
uh, in 31 BCE after the Battle of Actium. And, and so it is the Republic that creates the Roman Empire. And only when this empire is, is, is uh, in place do the, does the, the Roman Republic uh, fall apart in a series of extremely bloody civil wars uh, leading to the, uh, the supremacy of a, of a single uh, um, surviving warlord who becomes uh, the emperor of the Romans, the emperor Augustus, the, the first emperor of what we call the, the Principate, the, uh, the, the, this being the, uh, the actual title that Augustus and his successors use, Princeps, the first man in Rome. Uh, and so when we talk about the Roman Empire, we should be careful to understand that the actual Roman Empire, the Roman dominion of the civilized world of the, of the Mediterranean, um, is accomplished hundreds of years before there are actual Roman empires. It is accomplished by the Republic. Uh, interesting to note, too, as well, the Principate, uh, the, the Roman Empire, as ruled by emperors, is normally understood to end with the fall of the city of Rome to the barbarians in uh, in the fifth century CE, uh, in the uh, in the 470s. But in point of fact, this uh, by this time Rome had created a second capital in the east uh, it, at the old uh, the site of the old Greek colony of Byzantium, at the crossing from Europe to uh, Asia. Uh, at the Bosphorus, from the uh, from southeast Europe, from the Balkans into Anatolia, what is now Turkey, and this becomes the the Roman capital city of Constantinople, and and Rome ends up being ruled uh, as two empires uh, with uh, two or more emperors, and so when the city of Rome falls, the Roman Empire endures in the east, and it endures for another thousand years. Uh, the Roman Empire does not fall until the Turks. Uh, finally take the city of Constantinople in 1453, uh, one of the harbingers of the end of the medieval era. Our evidence for Roman history is, uh, uh, is, is um, uh, problematic for our earliest periods. Uh, the, the periods of the, of the kings and the early republic, uh, we know about uh, from writings that, um, that come from hundreds of years later, from the end of the republic, uh, and this is due to a number of things. Um, the Romans, part of the Roman identity is to, uh, is to reject um, uh, luxury and, uh, and decadence and indolence. Uh, and uh, and um, the, the Roman identity, what the, the Romans of later times called the Mos Maiorum, the ways of our ancestors, the, uh, the Roman identity is built around uh, self-sacrifice uh, and austerity. And so they tend to see um, both uh, ostentatious displays of wealth and things that are done for leisure, including, uh, including uh, you know, history and, and the writing of literature and, and theater as things that, are, that belong to the, uh, to the decadent East. Uh, more on that in a moment. But this means that uh, the, one of the primary sources of history that we have for our earliest period has to do with legends and folktales and also family traditions, which are actually very important to the Romans. When the Romans would uh, um, hold a funeral of an important individual, uh, one of the things that would happen at that funeral is that the, uh, the, the dead person's ancestors would, uh, uh, would be present and would speak eulogies of, uh, of both the deceased and of the family and of their own accomplishments. Uh, this is accomplished through actors, uh, through the preservation of death masks of, of important ancestors uh, that are kept in a, in a special cupboard uh, in the, the house of every important Roman. And uh, these masks would be accompanied by small scrolls which would describe the accomplishments of these, of these ancestors. And so it's important to great families to uh, preserve the, the traditions and, and, uh, and accounts of their, their uh, most famous historical members. Uh, as you might imagine, these tales are subject to embroidery. And uh, so as a result, uh, we, have, um, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have family traditions that uh, make their way into the Roman collective history later on that include, uh, that include a certain amount of, of, um, of spottiness and a certain amount of, of distortion. Um, 
over the course of the Republic, as the, the city of Rome becomes more important, as it comes to dominate and rule over more and more people, uh, it comes to um, respect and admire certain elements of, of Eastern culture, the Greeks and, uh, and other Easterners, and in order to you know, demonstrate their legitimacy as a great civilization, they begin to imbibe uh, certain kinds of Greek customs, the, the Greek language itself, uh, certain ideas of, of um, Greek political structure, and uh, Greek ideas of, of uh, literary expression and, uh, and rhetoric. And so, by the end of the Republic, the Romans are writing their own histories, they're writing their own plays and poems, uh, originally on the Greek model and, and, uh, um, and before too long adapted to uh, the, the Roman spirit and the Roman identity. And, and, by, and so at that point, the Romans start to try to tell their own story. Uh, the, uh, um, the story of the Romans is, is, is determined in part by geography, as it is for all peoples. Uh, in the case of the Romans, uh, Rome is, is, uh, and Italy is, is very far from the, the heart of the civilized world. The civilized world in, in the ancient era is Mesopotamia and Egypt and Canaan and Anatolia and, uh, and the Aegean, the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is where the, the great uh, um, wealth, this is where um, you know, huge amounts of commerce and uh, the movement of people and the interchange of ideas is taking place in the eastern Mediterranean. And so you know, Rome is, uh, is lying far from this in the western Mediterranean. Uh, uh, it uh, it's, uh, emerges relatively late in, in ancient history. Uh, and <clears throat> it is part of the, the, much, uh, you know, uh, the much more subdued um, you know, trade uh, uh, environment of the Western Mediterranean. And so, um, uh, uh, on top of this, uh, uh, Italy has always been uh, a uh, has always been a combination of, of different peoples and, and, and cultures. Even today, uh, Italy is, is a single country, but it is not a single culture. Uh, and so, uh, in the in the, uh, the early history of Italy is conditioned by um, by a couple of things. Already present in Italy, uh, before the Indo-Europeans arrive, are the Etruscans. And the Etruscans live um, to the north, on the western coast of Italy, in the land that is, now, uh, that is still named from Tuscany. Uh, the Etruscans called it Etruria. Uh, and then the Indo-Europeans arrive, and, and uh, Indo-European uh, culture, the Indo-European uh, society is one that is unlike that of the Mediterranean peoples. And so the Etruscans, for example, are, are in some ways a typical Mediterranean people, uh, even though they are unique and, and they're not related to anyone and their language is, is, uh, is unrelated to any other uh, language in, in the ancient world. Uh, the Etruscans uh, live in city-states. They are urban, they are centralized, um, they have a, a highly hierarchical class structure, uh, they are ruled over by kings. Um, and uh, they live in a city-state culture, much like in the Aegean, much like in Sumer, in which um, in, in which identity is focused on on the on the the center of, of the the city-state, on the uh, on the the heart of the city, and on the patron deity associated with it. Uh, and uh, the city-states of of Etruria are uh, share a common culture, but are in rivalry with each other politically and economically, and sometimes militarily. This is the typical Mediterranean setup uh, that the Etruscans have. Uh, the Indo-European peoples, um, the Indo-Europeans are uh, have a an economy that is based on pastoralism. Uh, they their primary agricultural base is the keeping of domesticated animals, um, you know, uh, cows, sheep, goats, so forth. Uh, and so they are much more mobile. Uh, they uh, they live in a, a wide expanse of land, and so instead of relying for water on tra for transportation, like the Mediterranean peoples do, they rely on the cart uh, and the axle. Um, and their their social structure is loose and spread out because uh, pastoralism requires large expanses of land for for grazing, uh, and so the um, their social structure is non-urban, decentralized. Um, it is tribal, it is clan-based, uh, and uh, the Indo-Europeans don't have a heritage of cities, don't have a heritage of boats. Um, instead, they're, they're centered on, uh, on horses and carts. We've seen this with the Mycenaeans, and, uh, and now we're seeing it again with the Italians. And many of the Italian tribes that move into Italy essentially retain this pastoral lifestyle. 
they're the ones that settle in the, in the highlands. If you look at the map of Italy, there is a, a, a mountain range that runs down the center of the peninsula that is known as uh, the Apennines. It is sort of the spine of Italy. And uh, it is the, 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 the pastoral Indo-European peoples that remain that way, uh, settle along the Apennine uh, and, and, um, and persist in this, uh, in, this, in this pastoral, rustic, decentralized, non-urban lifestyle. But a few of the Indo-European uh, tribes uh, settle on the coastlands uh, to the south of the Etruscans. Um, prominent amongst these are the Latins that settle just to the south of the Tiber River. And uh, like the Mycenaeans, they, uh, they see the city-state peoples that, they, uh, that are already native to the region, uh, they see their, their, um, their, their success uh, as a society and seek to emulate it. Uh, seek to uh, they embrace the idea of of improving themselves of, of of seeking progress as a civilization and so they build city states like the Etruscans and they model their political ideas around those of the Etruscans uh, and they imbibe a great deal of the Etruscan uh, religious ideology as well more on that in a moment and so these are the Latins that end up being uh, you know um, you know over, a little over 20 uh, city states that are founded in a relatively small and compact region just to the south of the Tiber uh, the greatest amongst these the, the what emerges as the the stronger and uh, most ambitious is Rome um, and so as we can see, uh, you know, Italy ends up being this, this hodgepodge of, of different kinds of people that so we can see from the language groupings. And this includes not only the Etruscans and the Indo-European peoples that arrive from the north, but also uh, the Greek colonists that, uh, uh, that settled in various colonies to the south. Uh, in the, uh, the boot of Italy, uh, further north, uh, including the great city of Neapolis, what is now Naples, and uh, on the island of Sicily, one of the most, um, uh, one of the strongest, most wealthy, and most populous uh, Greek colonies in the world, the city of Syracuse, uh, on the on the island of Sicily, uh, and so, and uh, there's a further diversity because the uh, the Phoenicians are active traders in this region. Originally, as part of the Phoenician trade routes that uh, stretch out from the Phoenician homeland in Canaan. Uh, and uh, uh, fairly early on, um, not long before Rome itself is founded, the city of Carthage is is founded around the the uh, uh, sometime in the eighth century. And and Carthage, this Phoenician colony, becomes the basis for uh, um, you know Phoenician trade power in the Western Mediterranean. Eventually, Carthage becomes the the main rival of Rome for trade dominance in the Western Mediterranean. And ultimately, Rome's nemesis, nemesis that uh, uh, um, uh, a, a, a rivalry that builds toward a, uh, a life or death struggle in the Punic Wars, the wars between Rome and Carthage um, that feature such great figures of ancient history as Hannibal. And so there are a number of parallels, as you, as you can see, between um, you know, Rome and Carthage and uh, the, uh, the similar rivalry between the Mycenaeans and Troy that, uh, again, ends up in a life-or-death struggle during the Bronze Age, several hundred years before. And so uh, the Phoenician traders um, are, are active in, in the Western Mediterranean, and uh, they bring with them a number of things that have influence over the, uh, the Etruscans and the Romans, the, the city dwellers on the coastal plains, as opposed to the, the rustic uh, uh, pastoralists in the highlands. Uh, these include the uh, uh, the the Tyrian purple, uh, the 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 royal purple that uh, is available only from the Phoenicians, and so is therefore a uh, um, a a very quickly adopted in amongst the Etruscans and the the Romans later as uh, as uh, indicative of status. Uh, only people at the top of society could use this color of purple, and also the alphabet. As the Phoenicians had passed their phonetic alphabet to the Greeks, so too they pass it to the Etruscans, uh, who pass it further on to the Romans. Uh, to the south, modern Magrycia, uh, the, uh, the lands of the Greeks in southern Italy is still in, in very uh, lively contact with the Greek world of the Aegean. Uh, Italy is not that far away from, uh, from Greece. And uh, so the, uh, the, the Greeks of modern Magrycia 
are are very much um, in tune with the the burgeoning uh, um, culture of the Greeks, very much in tune with uh, the Greek ideas of of expression, and also uh, very wealthy uh, from uh, from trade. The Etruscans themselves, what we can say about the Etruscans is relatively limited because the Etruscan society is eventually subsumed by the Romans. The Romans, uh, uh, as part of their process of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of dominion, undertake a process of Romanization in which the, the culture of the lands that they rule over is slowly absorbed into the Romans and thereby is assimilated and starts to disappear. So the Romans, you know, don't make the mistake of, of trying to repress the culture of, of peoples that they rule over. Um, they simply uh, uh, Romanize these lands. Um, there is a great deal of advantage in being Roman um, because of the prestige involved, because of the advantages of trade uh, and, and, and political advantages as well. Uh, and so, you know, you know, next generations of peoples that the, the Romans uh, uh, absorb and conquer, um, you know, actively uh, are motivated to uh, to learn Latin, the language of the Romans, and to pick up uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, uh, and embrace Latin ways and uh, and goods and so forth and so on. So, as a result, uh, the Etruscan language virtually disappears. The stories of the Etruscans vanish. Uh, uh, even stories that are written by the Romans have not come down to us. Uh, the Emperor Claudius is known to have written a history of the Etruscans, uh, which uh, has not survived. And so, what we know about the Etruscans is uh, uh, is partly from what we see from th from their burial remains. So, for example, this uh, uh, this uh, sarcophagus decoration of a of a married couple, um, and the bits and pieces that the Romans tell about them as part of their own history, uh, uh, and uh, the elements of Etruscan custom that uh, embed themselves in uh, in the way that the Romans do things. Uh, one of the most influential things uh, that uh, the Romans uh, you know take on from the Etruscans is a fundamentally important idea that the um, that the Etruscans and later the Romans cannot do anything important without first consulting the gods. And this means that uh, that the gods must be consulted before uh, any uh, major action by the state, whether it's uh, you know um, the passing of a law or even the meeting of the assembly, the uh, declaration of war or peace, treaties, uh, you know taxes, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, the, any kind of, of of public action, including the uh, the the inauguration of elected officials. The for the Etruscans, the way in which this works is the Etruscans practice something called haruspicia, in which the priests uh, uh, take an animal sacrifice. You know, for example, a sheep or or a goat, or sometimes an ox. Uh, depending on the occasion, and uh, they kill the animal, cut it open, and examine its liver. And the uh, the disposition of the liver, the way that the, the liver is healthy or has blemishes or whatever, is indicative of the disposition of the gods. And so, if the liver is healthy, uh, everything is okie dokie, and, and they can uh, proceed with whatever it is that they were about to do that they are consulting the gods about. But if there is a if there is a problem with the liver, if it is blemished or diseased. Uh, then the gods must be propitiated, and they they cannot act until um, until the uh, the problem has been resolved, and either a, a new course of action is decided upon, uh, or um, uh, or uh, the the gods are shown to have changed their mind. Uh, what we're looking at here is a diagram of a of a liver that was used by the uh, the Haruspex that is mapped out according to individual deities, and so by this means uh, the uh, the Etruscan priests would know which god was concerned with the action that they were planning to undertake. Uh, um, the Romans uh, adopted this viewpoint, and, and uh, the, from, throughout their entire history, the Romans are not able to uh, undertake any major action without first consulting the gods. Uh, the, the Romans at first uh, use uh, the Etruscan method of consultation using uh, examination of the liver, uh, and this continues to be one of the ways in which the gods might be consulted, but they very quickly adapt this to their own methodology um, by uh, undertaking a, uh, a a vigil in which the sky is examined for a period of time, uh, usually in the quiet of the very early morning, 
Um, and uh, the sky is mapped out into quadrants, and the movement of birds is, is, uh, is observed. And uh, certain kinds of birds, and which way they are moving and so forth, are taken as omens by the Romans uh, and uh, interpreted by the, the specialized priests that undertake these, uh, these uh, observations as to the disposition of the gods. Uh, these priests are called augurs, the priests with re special responsibility for observing the skies in this way. Uh, and uh, the practice of consulting the gods is called augury. And this is why, uh, you know, since uh, consultation of the gods is necessary, as I said, for the induction of an elected magistrate, uh, this is why the, um, the installation of an elected official is called to this day inauguration. Um, the natural result of this in, amongst the Romans is that the, the priestly class becomes uh, um, politically empowered with ramifications that we will talk about. Uh, the, uh, the Latins are, because they are very closely packed together, um, they are both in rivalry with each other and, uh, and also in very close communion. Unusual for city-state cultures, it is possible to, for example, uh, um, marry a citizen of, uh, of, uh, of another uh, Latin city and uh, and bring that uh, bring that woman home to you. Uh, and it is possible to um, you know for the uh, for the Latin cities to share and celebrate certain festivals together and so forth and so on. Um, Latium itself, as I said, is a fairly compact area, and Rome be, uh, uh, becomes the preeminent city amongst the Latins. Uh, this is partly by virtue of its uh, of its location. Uh, Rome lies along a, uh, a, the, the um, trade passageway uh, that, uh, that uh, parallels the Tiber uh, from the main port uh, at the mouth of the Tiber inland, uh, and it also lies at, at, at a key, uh, at one of the best fords of the Tiber. Um, it is uh, difficult to cross the Tiber to the north and to the south, uh, but uh, in this place here, just south of of the uh, of the island that you can see in this image, um, there is an excellent ford, and just to the Roman side of this, on the east, is the is the one of the oldest uh, uh, open spaces, one of the oldest marketplaces of the Romans, the the Forum Boarum, the the cattle marketplace. And so the uh, the Romans uh, uh, from their earliest history. Are, uh, are particularly keen on understanding the, the, uh, the hospitality toward the foreigner and the contributions that outsiders can make to Roman society. Uh, the Roman king is a priest king, uh, somewhat like the, uh, uh, the kings in Sumer. In other words, uh, the, um, the, the king is, is responsible for liaising with the gods and conducting the most important of the priestly rituals uh, on behalf of the entire community and, and overseeing the priestly class. Um, and, and, uh, and of course, the, the king is also central to uh, ensuring the smoothness of relations between you know, the classes of the Romans. Uh, the Roman monarchy is an elective position. Uh, it is not uh, uh, originally dynastic. And so you know, the, the people that are chosen to be king uh, are each strikingly different from each other. And in fact, Roman legend tends to assign key elements of Roman society, Roman political structure and religious structure. Each king is sort of responsible for helping to create some part of Rome. Uh, and this is a function of legend. This is the fact that we know, uh, we have no direct actual history of, of these rulers. We only have the, the legends that are associated with them. Um, the 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 structure of, of Roman society is built around the family, not around the individual. We've seen certain elements of this in other societies to the east, but it is extremely true amongst the Romans. Essentially, the the Roman family is this uh, is and when I say family, I mean extended family, uh, the individual sort of subset of the clan, uh, all of the people that descend from a particular individual. Uh, this extended family is, is, is each one of these is sort of uh, um, is sort of insulated, uh, so that everything within it is private, uh, and the everything within it is the domain and responsibility of the eldest male, the uh, 
the um, uh, the uh, the paterfamilias. And the paterfamilias is sort of represented is responsible for representing the family to the Roman public. And so, uh, as a result, uh, the, the, the Roman society, the Roman aristocracy during the regal period, and especially during the Republic, is, is made up of these chunks of family that interact with each other. Uh, and and uh, it is very much not about uh, individuals that might arise within these families. It is about the families themselves. And so the, the paterfamilias becomes... Uh, uh, becomes the dominant figure within a family, as well as one of a member of uh, a, a, a part of a group of similar men that are uh, the heads of their own families and who are each at similar uh, each have a similar kind of of, of you know power and influence within the family, but are more or less the same, more or less part of this collective magistracy uh, that the Romans have. And so, you know, these these family representatives form a part of um, the advisory council to the king that uh, becomes the senate, and later on, the senate is uh, is the chief uh, advisory body to the republic. It has no constitutional power, but it uh, preserves um, the Roman tradition and sees itself as guarding, uh, and protecting, and saving. Uh, the, uh, the 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 true nature of what it means to be Roman, the what I called before the Mos Maiorum, the ways of the ancestors. Roman names are very uh, 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 illustrative of the preeminence of the family in Roman life and the uh, unimportance of the individual. And so, here we see a a fairly typical Roman name: Gaius Julius Caesar which is one of the more famous of the Romans, uh, Julius Caesar. Um, It is uh, his name, what we call his name, his nomen, is Julius, which is his family name, his his gens, his clan name. Um, His prinomen, his first name, uh, uh, even this is, uh, it goes uh, uh, hardly any amount at all in identifying him as an individual. First of all, there are only um, a dozen to twenty or so of these prinoma, these family, uh, these first names, that are used in regularly in Roman society, uh, and so everyone you meet is is uh, is Gaius or Lucius or Marcus um, or Postumus or Aulus or whatever, Quintus, Sixtus. Uh, these names are are, uh, are 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 all in common circulation, and on top of this, they are often. Uh, systematized and automatic. In other words, within a certain family, the first son in, e- uh, in each generation might be always named Gaius, and the second son always named Quintus, and so forth. Uh, so even even the first name, the prinomen, hardly does anything to distinguish the individual. On the contrary, re- it reinforces the um, the uh, the collective nature of the Roman aristocracy. Um, your uh, uh, the a part of your formal Roman name is your affiliation, uh, uh, your um, immediate ancestors, and so this, what this is actually saying uh, is Gaius Julius, Gaius Filii, Filii uh, 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 Gaius Nati, which means uh, son of Gaius, grandson of Gaius. And so once again, uh, even your even your name, you know, is as much about your your ancestry. And uh, the and your family as as anything else. Um, it is possible for you to to get a nickname, a cognomen, which uh, might help to distinguish you. But there are two things about this. First of all, uh, these cognomena tend to be uh, unflattering, and uh, this is part of the idea that uh, that you know the Romans resist the the uh, the uh, the singling out of individuals. And so, uh, Caesar, for example, means hairy. And, you know, hairy in, in a way that is not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, gorgeous to behold. Uh, there are, you know, there are cognomena that, uh, so uh, one of the other uh, well known Romans of the late Republic is uh, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Cicero is uh, a word that means uh, chickpea. 
uh, Garbanzo, but uh, the, the context for this was some ancestor of, of uh, Marcus Tullius Cicero had a, a large carbuncle on the side of his nose that was the size and shape of a chickpea and, and ended up with that nickname. And the second thing about this, as you can see, is that you know, once the nickname is bestowed, uh, it becomes uh, passed on. And it becomes the name not for an individual, but for uh, a branch of a family. It becomes further reinforcement of the importance of uh, of family, even if it was you know bestowed in you know to uh, um, you know uh, in uh, as a result of some you know uh, attribute of an individual. So here are some examples of, of typical Roman male names: Marcus Julius Cicero that I just mentioned, uh, Sempronius Gracchus, uh, uh, Emilius Scaurus. Uh, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. Uh, so, you know, even uh, Magnus here, Magnus means the great, this is Pompey the Great, even that was bestowed as kind of a joke. Um, in other words, uh, Pompey was a, uh, um, was a follower of the dictator Sulla, but uh, had a great, very great sense of his own self-importance, and uh, when he came to Sulla, he brought his army with him, a private illegal army that uh, Sula very much needed in order to win over, win against his enemies. Uh, but in return for this, he demanded to be called Pompey the Great. And uh, Sula agreed because he thought it was hilarious. And uh, and uh, I can imagine that uh, whenever Sula said Pompeius Magnus, you could hear these sarcastic quotes. Um, but most of these, Cicero Gracchus, uh, Drusus Brutus, uh, Sula uh, and so forth are names that uh, originated in the myths of history and became um, and and you know may have started out as nicknames but ended up being names for branches of families. Uh, occasionally, you see a complementary cognomen. So, for example, Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius. Uh, Metellus Pius was called that because uh, Pius. Uh, it's it's the origin of our word pious. Um, you know, for in Latin it means devoted to one's parents, to one's father. And later on in the Christianized Middle Ages, it became devoted to, you know, God the Father. But, uh, you know, Pius was uh, remembered for having uh, been loyal to his father when everyone else turned against him. There's also people that are, that are uh, newcomers, uh, that are what the Romans called uh, novus homo, new men. So, for example, Gaius Marius, uh, Gaius Marius has uh, uh, no important ancestry. Uh, he is, uh, he has, in particular, uh, you were counted noble amongst the Romans if one of your ancestors was a consul or a praetor. And, the, and Marius had none of these things. He didn't even have a, uh, a, a cognomen. And so, you know, ended up sort of having to force his way to the top. Uh, Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony, uh, became powerful by attaching himself to Julius Caesar. Uh, Clodius Polcare, Polcare uh, means the beautiful, and so Publius Clodius Polcare was called the beautiful because he was so good looking that uh, he looked like a woman. Uh, Scipio Africanus was given the name Africanus uh, as in, in recognition of his conquest of, uh, of Carthage, of his defeat of Hannibal and the, the armies of the greatest threat that had ever existed to Rome. And this is a rare example of, of a cognomen that was actually granted by the Romans to an individual um, to, to single them out as, as having accomplished a great thing on behalf of the Romans. And, and this, even this, um, even for this man who saved Rome, uh, the, uh, the preeminence that he enjoyed afterwards made everyone uncomfortable, and the Romans did everything they could to ensure that Cornelius Scipio Africanus um, uh, was was uh, was blocked out of uh, and prevented from using the influence that came from his glory um, to further his own power. Uh, um, the the next two are famous Roman poets Virgil and Horace uh, in English, and uh, the last is is uh, is, is the great uh, dictator Fabius who. Um, uh, helped make possible the defeat of Hannibal um, by uh, making Hannibal chase him uh, up and down Italy uh, without engaging in a battle to give the Romans time to recover from the disastrous defeat of uh, at uh, Cannae. This is why he gets the nickname uh, uh, Comptator, which means the delayer. All right, so anyway, uh, Roman names. Uh, another thing about Roman names is, uh, uh, as you can imagine, so I've emphasized the importance of family in, uh, in Roman life. Uh, and uh, the unimportance of individuals. Uh, this probably will suggest to you something about marriage, that marriage is going to take place in Rome, amongst the Roman aristocracy, 
through arranged marriages as the bondings of individual families rather than the love matches between individuals. Uh, and uh, if that occurred to you, you're right. Um, and so part of the problem is that uh, the Roman aristocracy uh, ends up getting married to people that uh, they might not particularly like or want to have sex with. And so even though there's sort of a, a duty to uh, perpetuate your family name, to have children, to, uh, in, to perpetuate the aristocracy, uh, uh, you know, the, the Romans end up, uh, the Roman aristocracy ends up having a, a problem generating tradition, generating uh, children, in, in, especially in its oldest and most prestigious families, because the Romans are sleeping, sleeping with their mistresses instead. And so the Roman solution to this, apart from, you know, occasionally passing legislation that encourages childbearing, is if there isn't an heir and there's a danger of the family name dying away with, with your generation, what you do is to find a, a young man, and by young man I mean somebody who has already, you know, served his uh, um, uh, his his you know required military service, uh, already shown uh, um, potential as a as a you know as a Roman leader, to find a young man uh, of a you know less important family that is willing to trade their son for a a you know a certain amount of money. And so, you know, there is a, you know, a common practice in the Roman aristocracy of adoption to further the, name, further the family. And this is preserved in the family name. So, for example, Gaius Octavius uh, um, ends up being adopted by Julius Caesar and becomes Julius Caesar's heir, eventually the Emperor Augustus. And so his formal name goes from being Gaius Octavius to he takes his new father's name and then adds on to it the adjectival form of his old name. So he becomes Gaius Julius, Gaius Filius, uh, Caesar Octavianus. He becomes um, the, the uh, Octavian Julius Caesar. And, uh, um, and here's the real kicker. Um, the preeminence of family is preserved in the, in, the, in the masculine names of Romans. It's even more preserved in the feminine names of Romans. Uh, if um, uh, the children of of, uh, of of the Romans, uh, if they're born a male, they get a prinomen as well as the family name, the masculine form of the family name. If they're uh, uh, if they're female, all that they get is the feminine form of the ma of the family name. And so the daughter of Gaius Julius Caesar, for example, would simply be named Julia. And if he has another daughter, daughter, uh, that daughter is also named Julia. And if he has a third daughter, that daughter is also named Julia. Uh, and so, of course, in, in everyday life, these could easily be distinguished by, uh, by uh, you know, common attributes. Julia Maior would be the, you know, would be the older Julia. Julia Minor would be the younger Julia. Julia Tertia would be the third Julia, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, there's ways of doing this conversationally where you can refer to which Julia you're talking about. But the fact is that um, uh, what names the, the male Romans have uh, are part of their public persona, and uh, women in Rome have no official public persona. Uh, throughout their lives, women uh, are legally under the guardianship of some male. And so the process of, uh, of, of getting married is, is uh, legally the handing over of responsibility for a particular woman from the father, or if the father is dead, you know, the eldest brother or whatever, whoever the paterfamilias is of the wife's family, uh, to the husband. Uh, uh, if, a, um, if a woman, if there's a, if there's a divorce, which is possible, um, uh, the, the, uh, the woman reverts to the guardianship of, of her own family, uh, and um, if she is a widow, uh, she may uh, remain part of the family that uh, she married into under the guardianship of whoever is now the eldest member of that family, which may be her eldest son. So um, what does this mean for our understanding of gender in, in ancient Rome? Um, one of the things that is problematic in, in studying gender in particular is that uh, when we look at ways in which gender is reflected in certain aspects of society, they become very distorted. 
Uh, we've already seen this with uh, myth uh, with mythology and uh, uh, and literature. The ways in which um, uh, mythology and, and literature portray uh, uh, portray gender is uh, is a distortion, is a deliberate distortion of everyday social norms. Uh, uh, legally, um, you know, the, the 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 Romans have a very sharp divide, as we've seen, between the public and the private, and uh, the public world is 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 very much the domain of, of the citizen. Uh, citizens are property holders and those who can fight for that property. And so uh, the citizen is male, and that means the public world is the world of the male in Rome as in Athens. And so what this means is that, uh, uh, is that um, uh, the law is, is how people interact with the public world. And so women interact with the public world through men. Uh, through those who are empowered to act publicly, through uh, those who are citizens. Does that mean that women in Rome are repressed? Uh, not necessarily. Um, you know, the fact that, that women must be uh, legally understood to be under the guardianship of a male um, does not mean that women lead oppressed lives in Rome. We need more information. We need more evidence than just the legal aspect, which deals with very specific kinds of interactions in, in, in the public domain. Um, uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, when we look at uh, marriage, for example, there are two kinds of, uh, uh, of marriage. Uh, one is marriage with manas, uh, mar marriage uh, with, uh, uh, with the, the hand or the handing over. This is the, the ancient formal tradition of marriage, and uh, it is essentially identical to the, uh, the, the ceremony of the transfer of property. Uh, um, there is also a form of common law marriage, which uh, essentially says that if you have lived together for a certain amount of time, then you, you know, can be considered married. Um, uh, marriage with manas is required in, in certain of the more prestigious families, um, but uh, the, you know, the, the, the large majority of, of you know, the Roman masses and, and uh, many of the families within the aristocracy uh, do not bind themselves to using only marriage with manas. Uh, children in uh, Roman society, in the aristocracy, children are, are looked after uh, often by, um, uh, by, uh, by uh, tutors. And so, uh, you know, there will be a wet nurse for infants, and then there will be a pedagogue, somebody who's responsible for young children, for, you know, for beginning their education and so forth. Um, the, as Rome becomes stronger and more powerful, it, uh, uh, it demonstrates a uh, status uh, in a number of ways, uh, within, you know, from family to family. One of these is uh, the accumulation of domestic servants. Um, you know, all aristocratic families, in order to demonstrate their status, they need to have servants in the household. And uh, a large majority of these are, are slaves, uh, including the individuals that uh, take care of the children. And so, you know, they're, you know, within the aristocracy, the connection between mother and child is often, uh, is often uh, um, uh, sort of secondhand through the, uh, through the domestics whose immediate day-to-day -day responsibility is the, is the care of the children. Uh, the, uh, the Roman economy comes to depend more and more on slaves in general, uh, um, both for, you know, uh, domestic life, uh, for um, the cultivation of, of uh, large uh, agricultural estates for manufacture and factories. Uh, Roman industrial production becomes uh, a key part of its economy, uh, you know, including you know, uh, textiles and ceramics and weapons and tools and so forth. And uh, some of these factories uh, are, are, um, are worked by slaves. Uh, and, of course, uh, of course mining. But the thing about uh, slaves in, in the Roman world, uh, the Romans are accustomed to... Uh, to having slaves about them, uh, and uh, the you know, in, and in acquiring them as you know, captives of war and so forth, uh, but they don't assume that the, the condition of slave is hereditary. That uh, you know, certain kinds of people are meant to be slaves or whatever. Um, they have much less of a sense of us versus them than even the Greeks, with their divide between you know, Hellas and uh, the barbarians. The Romans uh, come from an environment of. Uh, of, of diversity within Italy, and the more places they dominate, the more uh, diverse their dominion becomes. 
And so uh, their concept of uh, enslavement includes the idea that uh, this is a temporary condition. Uh, manumission is, is freely available. Uh, slaves can purchase their freedom, or um, they might be freed after many years of, of good service. And so as a result, there's a large population of freed men and freed women in Roman society uh, um, that are sort of, so we have the slaves as this bottom class, and we have this, this another layer of, of, of people that are important to the economy that uh, often serve in, in sort of um, positions in supervision of, of slaves, uh, the freedmen and freedwomen, and then, you know, the Roman citizens. Uh, and we'll be talking more in uh, the next, uh, in, in another lecture about, um, you know, the freed woman and uh, the slave woman as, uh, and, and how we understand uh, uh, their role in, in Roman society. Uh, the Romans create, create uh, place a great deal of, of importance on, on adapting to um, whatever is demanded in a particular crisis. Uh, they, um, they focus on the Roman identity and ensuring that it survives, but um, they, are, uh, they understand that in order to survive, they must um, respond to crises with flexibility and with the, uh, an openness to adapting to and adopting whatever new idea is necessary. This comes in part from having grown up uh, between these much older and wealthier cultures the Etruscans to the north and the Greeks to the south, and the awareness that they are late to the scene uh, and that, they, that their origins are much more modest. The Romans know from the beginning uh, that, uh, that, you know, that they are not the oldest or, or most sophisticated or advanced society. Um, and so uh, what, they, what they concentrate on is uh, for Rome to be the strongest and the most successful. Um, uh, that uh, that there is uh, that the quality of being a Roman, this rejection of uh, of luxury and ostentation uh, and indolence, um, this embracing of of sacrifice and austerity, um, this will make the Roman a better kind of person. Um, despite you know, despite the fact that Rome itself is 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 younger and rawer than all of these older and wealthier societies. And so when the Romans encounter a crisis, they take into themselves uh, whatever is necessary in order for that quality of being a Roman to, um, to advance to um, the next uh, chapter of their, of their story rather than being crushed and destroyed by those who might be, uh, might be older and more powerful than themselves. And eventually, uh, through this stratagem, the Romans become the strongest and most powerful nation in the world. All right, so um, the readings, uh, the Roman nature, this is a great chapter. This is very important that you, uh, that you read this chapter if you haven't already. Um, this is a, an excellent summary of, of, uh, of a, a huge amount of information about what it means to be uh, a Roman aristocratic woman, a, a wife and mother within the Roman nobility. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Romans themselves had very definite ideas of, of what is the ideal Roman matron. In the same way that they had idea, very definite ideas about what is the ideal Roman male, uh, and uh, we see you know certain elements of this in the the Roman women that are are held up for uh, for praise, and so we see mentioned at the beginning of this chapter Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi. Uh, the Gracchi are are you know two you know um, radical politicians that helped to bring about the. Um, uh, the, the years of civil war that ended the, the Republic. Um, but Cornelia, Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi, is, is remembered as being uh, the ideal Roman matron, both by Roman men and by Roman women. Uh, you know, a century or two later, you still see women saying to themselves, what would Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi, do in this situation? And so it's, it's striking what it is that she is praised for. Uh, she is, uh, Cornelia is far from being uh, subservient or submissive. On the contrary, she is, uh, she is uh, positive and engaged and, and aggressive on behalf of her family. Um, and uh, we see, uh, you know, a number of other examples of different kinds of praiseworthy matrons. We see uh, Atavia, the sister of Octavius, uh, the Emperor Augustus. Octavia is, is remembered as being praised uh, because uh, even though you know, she was provoked 
through uh, uh, to uh, by the misbehavior of her husband Mark Antony, who ended up uh, abandoning her uh, for Cleopatra and marrying Cleopatra, even though he was already married to Octavia. Octavia, nonetheless, continued to act uh, as mother and to raise not only her children with uh, uh, Antony, but also uh, Antony's children by his previous marriage. Uh, and, uh, you know, continued to live a, an admirable, upright, and, and, and moral life, uh, and to be, uh, to do whatever is necessary, uh, you know, for her as a wife and mother to protect and preserve her family. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the most uh, complex of these maybe is, is Livia, uh, Livia, the wife of, uh, of, of Augustus who ends up um, uh, sharing uh, Augustus's responsibilities of rule over Rome uh, and doing so in a way that, uh, that complements uh, uh, Augustus uh, and um, becoming responsible for sort of uh, the, the private aspects of Augustus's rule. Uh, and so, for example, she becomes, uh, she becomes responsible for um, ensuring the morality of the members of the Senate and uh, striking from the senatorial roles those who have um, in, engaged in some kind of moral turpitude. But, you know, most important that, that Lelia stands up to stand beside her husband uh, and to ensure, you know, her husband's success. Uh, so um, our two um, uh, uh, primary source readings for today, uh, um, the capture of the Sabine women. This is a this is a story that is part of the the legend of, of Romulus, the uh, the the putative founder of, of Rome. And uh, the basic idea is that uh, the 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 city of Rome was settled by uh, a, a group of adventurers under Romulus uh, at Romulus's command, along with his twin brother Remus. And, uh, you know, and they, you know, they, you know, they were sort of, um, you know, breaking off from the, you know, the, the larger cities to the south, and they create this new colony at Rome on the banks of the Tiber, and they realize that uh, after a while that they forgot to bring any women with them. And uh, so uh, what they, you know, Romulus' solution for this is strategy, is, is, is craft, is subterfuge. Uh, he invites all the neighboring communities, including the, their neighbor and neighbors, the Sabines, uh, to uh, a, 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 a joint festival in honor both of the founding of Rome and in, order of, in, in honor of, of gods that they have in common. And, uh, you know, while this festival is taking place and all the men are getting drunk, uh, the daughters that they had brought with them are all rounded up by the Romans and uh, married to them in a secret uh, midnight ceremony. Now the Samites come back the next day, uh, and uh, they are ready to uh, uh, wipe Rome off the map. Uh, they're ready to obliterate the Romans for this huge outrage. And uh, according to the story, um, the, uh, the the armies of the Romans and the Samites are, are lined up opposite each other, and they're about to uh, fall into this terrible battle when uh, the uh, the women, uh, the women that were abducted and married to the Romans, uh, rush out. Uh, and stand between them and, and insist that they not fight. And what they say is that uh, uh, we are Romans now. Uh, you cannot uh, take us. Uh, you cannot uh, uh, bring us back uh, because we now belong to the Romans. And so, you know, the, uh, there's a couple of aspects of this. One is, uh, you know, the, you know the, the legal aspect that they have been handed over by marriage. Um, more uh, likely is, is the idea that uh, this marriage was, uh, was consummated uh, immediately afterwards. And so uh, this means that, uh, that they are no longer maidens. They are now matrons. Uh, they are now wives. Uh, and uh, this means that uh, their responsibilities have changed from being, you know, maidens who were daughters to matrons who are now wives. Uh, you know, this is, you know, on the one hand, of course, this is a, this is a story about, uh, uh, you know, men taking women and making them their own. Uh, and in another way, this is a story about, uh, you know, women who, having had this happen to them, understand what their responsibilities are. Uh, the, uh, the kings are cast out of Rome. Uh, according to legend, as a, the result of uh, um, a, a, a particular provocation, the son of the king, uh, Sextus uh, Tarquin, 
uh, is the, the the Tarquin himself uh, was called Tarquin Superbus, Tarquin the Arrogant, um, and uh, he had already demonstrated this this arrogance in seizing the throne for himself. He's a usurper uh, uh, in 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 seeing this, in himself as being entitled to the throne because he's a son of a former king, even though that's not how a monarchy worked in Rome. Uh, and so forth and so on, uh, Tarquin Superbus is already a bad king. And then uh, Sextus, his son, is is demonstrating even greater arrogance by, uh, he has a, a sort of uh, contest amongst his uh, amongst his buddies to figure out which of the uh, which of the women that they know are the most uh, pure and noble. And, you know, Sextus decides to uh, take the, the one that they decide is the most noble, Lucretia, uh, and rape her in order to take this purity away from her. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, the rape of Lucretia uh, becomes the, uh, the, the instigation, the catalyst for the Roman rejection of kings altogether. They don't just get rid of, of Tarquin Superbus and the son, they get rid of the whole idea of kings. It's the idea of subjecting themselves to um, the, the rule and arrogance of an individual uh, had already been starting to grate on the, the noble families of Rome, uh, and uh, with the actions of of Sextus, uh, they are now done with it. Uh, the symbology here is, is vitally important. This is a, a way of, in terms of understanding the Romans, uh, Lucretia, because she's pure, uh, she represents uh, uh, something that the, the Romans hold in great value. Uh, the Romans uh, um, you know, see themselves as warriors. Uh, and uh, they, uh, when, uh, outside of Rome, outside the sacred boundaries of Rome, uh, they, they, you know, they, they fight with, uh, uh, with ruthlessness. Um, and uh, in order to believe that they are, uh, that the Roman idea is superior to all of these older and stronger societies, uh, they must hold on to the idea that it is pure, and they invest that in their virginal women. They invest the idea of Roman purity in their virginal women, and uh, they create a, a the, the keeper of the eternal flame, that represents uh, um, Rome's uh, uh, immortality. The keeper of the Roman flame are a a set of special aristocratic princesses um, whose job is, whose role is uh, to remain virginal their entire lives in order to preserve and persist Rome's and embody Rome's very purity. These are the Vestal Virgins who dedicate themselves to the goddess Vesta uh, and to uh, embody this, this concept and so the rape of Lucretia, as a result, especially um, told centuries later, when this uh, um, when this purity of uh, of the Virgin, and especially you know of uh, as embodied by the Vestal Virgins, is a matter of course is 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 embedded in, in Roman public life for you know for uh, much further back than than uh, than anybody knows. Um, uh, the one thing that uh, that could bring about the rejection of the very idea of of a, of a king. Is, is violation of a virgin. All right, so the, uh, the Bowright article, um, the Forum Romanum is, uh, is the, the central open space of Rome. Uh, it's, it's somewhat like the Angora, the marketplace back in, uh, in, in, in a palace, in a Greek city like Athens. Uh, but the difference is, you know, the Angora is, is the meeting place for everyone. And it is the, the central social nexus for you know men, women, and children throughout Athenian society. The Forum Romanum is uh, the the public space wherein public activities are, are undertaken. And by public activities, I mean civic activities. Uh, you know the, the meeting of the tribal legislature, um, the uh, the holding of um, of lawsuits, uh, and uh, uh, you know the the publication of. Of, of laws and uh, the, the trade calendar, and so forth and so on. And so this means that, uh, that we see that the, the forum is, a, is the domain of men. And so it's very interesting to, uh, to look at the ways in which women uh, impinge upon this male space. And so this is one of the things that Paul Wright is doing. Uh, one of the things that, um, that, uh, that comes out of this is, you know, there are things that are associated with women and with uh, female d- divinities, uh, you know, on the on the edges of the forum, but also that women become present in the forum collectively, uh, that they that they show up in the forum as 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 angry or or uh, or weeping mobs of women uh, in times of great cataclysm, 
and uh, this is this is the the manifestation of of you know what is always there the the female concern for public life and for the future of Rome as mothers and wives uh, that uh, uh, in in times of great crisis can uh, can emerge even into the forum itself. But the other thing that Bill Wright talks about is that over time there is a greater shift away from this. Uh, there's gender polarity, and there's more of a sense of 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 a presence and visibility for women, and for you know the uh, the importance of the of the marital bond. By the time we get to you know the imperial era, uh, two matrons of the late republic um, is a, is uh, uh, is an interesting article um, uh, that looks at a, at a few sort of case studies. One of which is uh, Serelia, who is. The um, the mother of Brutus, the uh, the assassin, and uh, a, a a mistress of, of Julius Caesar, uh, and so you know this is uh, this is sort of to get uh, a sense of the kinds of you know freedom and choices that are available to you know aristocratic matrons of the late Republic, um, you know the. Uh, uh, the 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 idea that there are certain kinds of choices and freedoms that are available uh, that are not necessarily immediately obvious to us, um, and this is particularly you know in light of the fact that in the uh, in the period of the first emperors, at the beginning of the Principate, uh, the we're in the time of the the first uh, clan of emperors is called the Julio Claudians, and so this is uh, Augustus, Tiberius, uh, Caligula, Nero. And the uh, the Julio Claudians, this this whole extended family, they, they rule over Rome for many decades. Augustus himself has power over Rome in one way or another for fifty years. Um, but this family is is short on men, and so there is a uh, there is a need for not only the assistance of women like Lelia, Augustus's wife, uh, and uh, you know Agrippinilla, and um, you know and. Uh, Antonia and so forth and so on. Uh, to not only for the assistance of women, but also there, you know, there is a, a very uh, unusual sense to which um, legitimacy for rule is transmitted through women in um, in the Julio Claudians. And so uh, this is certain. This is uh, to a certain extent. This is an, uh, not an exception, but uh, it's um, the um, the visibility and role of women in the Julio Claudian family is. Uh, is much more expanded because of the the accidental nature of this extended family, but uh, it does mean that the precedent is set fairly early on uh, for the importance, the contributions of female members of the imperial family, especially wives of emperors. And so, uh, the idea of an Augusta, uh, the idea of you know a, a an empress who has a role not in ruling over the Roman Empire, but in uh, uh, in, in assisting the emperor's relationship with uh, with uh, the the lives of, of his ordinary citizens in Rome is is, is accepted and understood. This, the Augusta is not necessarily the wife. So, for example, uh, um, Livia becomes a, a you know Augusta, but um, she's also Augusta during the reign of her son Tiberius. Uh, and so the uh, the imperial um, women at Rome, uh, you know, uh, is, a, is a further explanation of a similar aspect of the topic um, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, you know, the unusual nature of, of imperial women compared to the expectations of Roman matrons. And, you know, this ends up with a, a great deal of um, complexity uh, because, you know, essentially there's something, you know, fundamentally you know, conflicting about, you know, having a certain amount of public power and at the same time being the ideal Roman matron. And yet, the ideal Roman matron, like Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi, is is someone who is assertive and, and even aggressive in, you know, in protecting the standing of her family. And so the the so-called power of the, uh, of the Roman imperial women sort of needs to be seen in this light, that it's, uh, that the Romans would understand it in terms of the role of the matron uh, as as acting on behalf of uh, and in protection of the standing of the family to which she belongs, uh, and then uh, uh, the 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 final article, Emilia Pudentilla. Uh, this uh, this is talking about 
the the uh, the situation of the Roman aristocratic woman in the colonies, in the provinces, uh, in in this particular case, uh, the province of of uh, one of the provinces of northern Africa, and how you know these are even with distance from Rome, the um, the the expectations of a of a matron and of a widow are are part of um, the, the fabric of Roman society. All right, so um, take a close look at the at the Pomeroy chapter and uh, and and um, and uh, talk about your reactions both to what you think is what you're seeing in the the Roman attitude toward the matron and toward the maiden toward the virgin, and uh, also your reactions to the readings, the capture of the Sabine women and the rape of Lucretia. <laughs>